Do we have apologies so that maybe we expect others to join in in the next few minutes? Uh, Chair, the only apology I've received is from uh, Honorable Vessel. I didn't receive any apologies. Okay, let's wait for a few minutes so that we can be six and start with the meeting.
Uh, Tebo, how many are we now? Are we five? I see one of the Komo is connected. Yes, we just need one more and we'll uh, be able to the, Hello, Tebo. You seem to be having a problem with your connectivity, your signal. Hello? Yeah, she does, Chair. She was saying that we're still short of one, and I have asked um, Aaron to please send a link to Comrade Depo because, because she's available, but apparently she... Oh, yes, I was saying we have five. We just still need one more and we can be able to start. Say. Hello? Hello, Tebu. Where are you? Are you in Freiburg where there's problem of connectivity? Afternoon, sir. Yes. <laughs> I mean, where, Cape where, Town. <laughs> you are in Cape Town. Chairperson, Comrade Dipua Peters is also in. I think we made the quorum now. I don't know. Probably it has to do with the whole load shading thing. Okay. Um, so, okay. Honorable Peters. Uh, okay. Yeah, Honorable Peters has connected. Uh, Welcome, honorable members uh, of the Standing Committee Finance. Uh, welcome officials from uh, National Treasury, Reserve Bank, uh, and other entities under National Treasury. Uh, let's also welcome stakeholders uh, who are here to make submissions. Uh, yes, the meeting... sir. We are opening the meeting, Tebo. We are, we are now correcting. Uh, the meeting is officially open. Uh, the purpose or the main item today in the agenda is the public hearing on the financial sector laws Amendment Bill B15-2020. Uh, are there apologies? Uh, Alan, you said there is an apology of honorable vessels. I think that's the apology that we have. Uh, I will also request apology that uh, for a few minutes, uh, I will just be dealing with some logistics for uh, tomorrow's by-elections uh, here in Gauteng. Uh, so uh, that's the apology that I'm giving. Uh, I will come back after some minutes. I won't take long, I hope. Uh, in the meantime, I will request uh, Honorable Abram to chair the meeting. Uh, Honorable Abram, are you there in the platform? Yes, I'm here, Chair. Okay. Can you proceed <laughs> with the next item? Uh, I will come back after I will have sorted... Uh, the logistics for tomorrow's by-elections. Nogse, are you still there? Ah, uh, yes, sure, I'm here. I think the next item would be a presentation by Cosato. 
Okay, over to you. Okay. Thank you. Um, at this point, we are going to get the presentation from Kosato. Can you come in? Yeah, Comrade Matthew, is it you? Okay. No, no, thanks, Comrade Chair. We can come in. Um, I think just give me a second to try to share the screen um, quickly. Um, it's, hopefully, I can manage it without collapsing anything. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, I've I've managed to make history comment here by figuring out how to share the screen, so I don't need to abuse um, Alan for once. Um, I think committee, let me just, um, and I hope my connection is decent, um, but I just want to thank the committee for giving us space as Kosar to indicate our support for the bill and also our one proposed amendment to it. Um, we think this is quite a critical bill and we're quite pleased that it's before parliament now. So Chair, I think we just want to, to work on the bill firstly. Um, I think to thank Treasury for tabling it. Um, we believe as COSATU, it's a necessary bill. It's long overdue, uh, long overdue intervention by government in the financial sector. And I think, Chair, our motivation is, is based upon the premise that we believe it is going to help to protect ordinary workers and depositors. Um, in particular, Comrade Chair, we think it's going to protect pensioners, but also equally, Chair, it's going to protect the financial sector and the economy at large, and of course, government too. Chair, we are though worried about one specific clause in the bill when we come to it in our one proposed amendment, um, clause 166W of the bill, where it deals with the issue of the ranking of, of creditors when it comes to the disposal of uh, liquidated banks' assets. Um, Chair, we believe that that specific provision, the only provision we believe needs to be amended in the bill to ensure that the most vulnerable depositors, um, specifically honorable members, um, pensioners and the unemployed and workers in general, including the workers at those banks, that they should be prioritized and they should be first in the queue when banks are wound up and assets are disposed of. Um, we believe, Comrade Chair, that to date, um, South African law has actually failed to ensure these vulnerable categories of creditors are prioritized when it comes to the liquidation of company assets. Chair, our motivation as COSATA for why we support this bill um, is that is born from our practical experience, I think, as all of us would know. Um, we have and also born for the need to protect workers and the pensioners, unemployed, um, SMEs, even the state itself, um, despite all of its resources. And of course, the economy and the financial sector at large, from what we often see as reckless behavior in many financial institutions. And not just us in South Africa have been affected by these instances, but across the world. So we think, Chair, that we have learned from the experiences this, that there's a need for the bill. Uh, specifically, we believe it's going to help to empower the Reserve Bank to provide meaningful oversight over the sector and the state at large, and when necessary, to capacitate them to intervene in the sector. Chair, I think just to refresh honorable members' memories, um, and I think the Comrade Chair Mashongai will also specifically know, coming from Lompoko, about the painful experience we haven't had in the past. I think all of us have seen, if you remember a few years ago, what nearly happened with the African Bank, which required very decisive intervention by the Reserve Bank, by Treasury, by the other commercial banks to save it, to save depositors' assets, to try to save those workers' jobs as well. So we also saw with the VBS in Lampopo very, very re recently, a few years ago, what happened there. Um, we saw that workers' pensions, municipal workers in particular, were lost. We saw not just in the public honorable members, but in other provinces, Northwest, Free State, Gauteng too, where they had invested in VBS. Workers and pensioners lost their savings. Pensions were, were simply lost. And again, the Reserve Bank and the commercial banks and government had to intervene to clean up the mess of reckless and often criminal behavior in banks. Chair, I think it's to state the obvious, but when these things happen, it is the poor who are hit the hardest. Um, we have seen workers losing their jobs and their savings. We've seen workers of those specific banks, like at VBS, losing their jobs and their pensions, and nothing is left for them. We've seen pensioners lose life savings and literally left to fend for themselves. I think honorable members re would remember the painful images we saw in Lumpopo, 
of pensioners in the 80s, grandmothers, great grandmothers, having to queue from the middle of the night out of desperation to try to withdraw the money, which is already gone. We've seen small business losing what little money they have, being forced to retrench and to close the, 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 the doors. So I think internationally, we can see many examples which again alert us to the serious danger, um, I think as Treasury had highlighted in the presentation to the committee of the contagion effect. We saw what happened in Iceland, and it often can take one simple little rumor or incident to spark a run on banks. Um, we saw it happening in Britain about uh, 12 years ago, I think the Royal Bank of Scotland. We saw it in the US with the two housing banks, et cetera. We don't think, Honorable Chair, that right now, given the pandemic, the recession, the very depleted public fiscal resources we have, government has currently, that South Africa would be, would be in a strong position to withstand such a crisis. So hence, even greater need to pass this bill. Equally, we don't think it's fair, and we know government has got no choice, but it's not fair for government to be forced, literally a blackmail, to spend billions of, of, of taxes, workers, taxpayers' money, bailing on banks. We know there is no choice. You cannot allow these banks to fail for obvious reasons. But again, it's literally pointing a gun to the head of government to say we can engage in reckless behavior in the banks and government will pick up the tab for us. Um, and of course, as COSATA, we're very sensitive to any bleeding of state finances because it'll be public, it'll be workers in the public sector, entities, SOEs who will be told there is no money for the salary increases to keep up with inflation, the pensions might be decimated, or they'll, they'll, they'll be retrenched. Public services will be under severe pressure. Um, I think Comrade Chair also is quite um, critical given that we are the sole remaining member of the G20, which doesn't have such legislation to quickly put it into effect. Again, Comrade Chair, you know, as we're in economic recession, we are competing against many other countries with less challenges to attract investment. We can't afford to be, to be behind the rest of, our, of, of the world. Chair, so I think our provisions, our support for the bill are, are largely centered on two broad uh, sets of provisions. I think one is around the depositors insurance funds. Uh, we believe this is a wise and a prudent provision to have there. So we support it. We think Comiche is going to help to protect ordinary workers and depositors, but in particular pensioners from the worst effects of collapse of banks when they collapse. Um, if we had such a provision five years ago, Chair, we think many of the pensioners in Vembe would not have been left completely destitute when VBS collapsed. Um, equally, Comiche, is going to help to protect the state resources um, from being drained by having to bail banks at exorbitant costs. But I think, Chair, it was also critical, and this obviously can be dealt in regulations and other administrative interventions, but that these insurance premiums must be affordable. They should not be a, become a burden to ordinary depositors. Chair, I think also what we support as COSATO is any provisions which capacitate the state. We believe there are quite a few provisions in this bill which will help to capacitate the state, in particular the Reserve Bank, um, the Financial Sector Conduct Authority and Treasury, um, to ensure they're able to fulfill their duties, their legal duties, to hold the financial sector to account, to oversee it, and where necessary to, to undertake the necessary interventions. Chair, one specific proposed amendment to the bill, and it's only one proposed amendment, um, is around clause 166W, um, subclause two, this A, B, and C, which deals with the ranking of claims. So we were very worried about the, the proposed ranking in the bill. We hope we've interpreted it incorrectly, but if our understanding that it's correct, it's, it, it's, it's worrying to us. So it appears to us, Comrade Chair, that when the assets of a bank are disposed of, that the first in the queue would be the, the secured lenders. Um, those would be banks who have lent to, to the bank in question, other uh, lenders or companies which have lent to their bank in question, which have got secured um, loans to those banks. Um, for our understanding of the, of the proposed ranking is that unsecured creditors or ordinary depositors will be ranked in essence fourth in the queue. Um, so that means workers and pensioners, SMEs will be fourth in the queue. And that for us is a, is a huge matter of concern, Comrade Chair. Um, just to unpack it, why we're concerned is that ordinary workers or pensioners, <clears throat> they cannot afford the delays in accessing their, their very small savings. Often it takes months, sometimes even years, for these assets to be dis dispersed. 
And these are people who have no other source of income. Pensioners have no other source of income. Workers live for the salary month to month. So when their funds are depleted, they are thrown out into the street, they can lose their houses, their property, et cetera, for no fault of their own. Um, companies and banks, they have other sources of income, they have other assets, they have significant resources. They can afford to take a hit, but ordinary pensioners and workers, the unemployed, they literally cannot take a, a hit. But again, we've seen time and again, they're left on the, sitting on the curbside. I think members might rec recall the issue of the Aurora mine about 10 years ago. Those mine workers are still waiting for their assets, for the small little salaries 10 years later. But the liquidators, the companies have long ago received their funds. So Chair, for us, this kind of an approach to the disposal of assets is one which will leave workers and pensioners at risk of receiving nothing at the end. Chair, I think for us, at a principal level, that kind of a ranking is simply wrong, it's immoral. We also don't believe, Comrade Chair, that it can be interpreted as being aligned with the constitutional requirements for legislation to be equitable. We can't place workers and pensioners behind large banks. We don't think that's fair and equally it cannot be rational in any interpretation. And we don't think that would, would pass a progressive interpretation of the constitution, honorable members. Chair, so our proposal for clause 166 W2 is that the ranking just should simply be amended. It should be amended to put that unsecured creditors, specifically chair, pensioners, the unemployed and workers are ranked first in the queue to receive their, their, their money or when the assets are disposed of. And that can be a simple re-ranking of clause 166 W, 2A, B, and C. But shall we think that the way the law, the, the bill is worded in that specific clause, it's a little bit vague. And it might be critical, in fact, we would hope that we can convince members and treasury, the need to explicitly state that it'll be pensioners, the unemployed and workers who will secure first preference during the disposal of bank assets. And that should include those workers at those banks because they also will lose their jobs. So in conclusion, Comrade Chair and Honorable Members, um, I think we want to say as Kusatu that we welcome this bill. Uh, we support it. We believe it's a very progressive, um, a long overdue bill. We hope to see Parliament passing it as a matter of priority. We would not want it to, to see it being delayed for too long unnecessarily. Um, Chair, I think we would want to agree with government. We believe it's going to help to to protect through the Depositors Insurance Fund, it will help protect millions of workers and pensioners in the state and the economy of the savings of the investments, et cetera. Um, we believe the provisions are gonna further capacity of the state and the Reserve Bank to play the critical oversight roles. Chair, we hope though that parliament will agree to our specific single proposed amendment uh, with regards to the ranking of creditors. Um, we again, Chair, we don't think it can be acceptable or moral for pensioners and for workers to be left waiting for months and years to access what is left of the very, very meager savings. Um, equally, Comrade Ch Chair, members, workers and pensioners shouldn't have to wait to receive what is left after secured creditors have, have had their fill. So lastly, Comrade Chair, um, we'd want to see this provision be included in the bill now. Um, we appreciate government might say well, they have not had time to think about it. But Chair, if we delay it for another bill, that could be in five years' time. Um, we think Parliament is fully capacitated to make the NSA amendments now. It will not be a large leap from the provision of the existing bill, but simply a reordering of the, of the ranking of creditors. But Chair, we think this will help really to further extend the very progressive provisions of this bill and also equally help to ensure that our pensioners, our workers are properly protected going forward. Um, so that's our presentation in a nutshell, Comrade Chair. Um, I hope I've not taken too long, but thank you for members and for the committee for giving us space to raise our views and our support for the bill. Thank you, Comrade Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Comrade Matthew. Uh, this point we will give over to Petrinity to make their presentation. Petrinity. Thanks very much, Jay Abrams. Um, let me also quickly just share my screen with you. Um, there it is. Just quickly going to enlarge it. Uh, 
I'll say. Right. Um, Chair Abram, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, my dear. Please go ahead. Okay, right, right. Thanks very much. Um, thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, I also just like to thank you for the opportunity to provide um, you um, uh, Excuse me, on excuse me one minute. Involved. I Hello. also think it's quite a huge leap uh, forward Hello. to managing the Trinity. The Trinity. Yes, ma yes, yes, man. The, Hello, ma'am. Yeah, your line is not very clear. Yes. I don't know what you can do. Yes. Probably the first thing to do maybe would be to just switch off your your video camera. Really? I'm, I'm, I'm sure you can do that. I don't know what's making it so unclear. Right. Let me quickly do that. Right, right. Um, Ma'am, can you hear me now? Oh, loud and clear. Ma'am, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Loud and clear. Okay, wonderful. That is great. <laughs> oh, thank you very much, ma'am, um, for the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, just to quick give you a background, um, who I am. Oh, my dear. You are gone again. My name is Judy. Um, I've been a competition law and policy economist for the past 20 years um, with uh, recent experience uh, in, in studies in future studies um, and to become honest. Okay. We can't hear you now. The Trinity. The Trinity, you lo we lost you now. Uh, Ms. Abraham, I think she um, was kicked off the platform. I just uh, let her in again, so um, she's hopefully oh. back on right now. Thank you, Alan. Thanks so much. Uh, good day, Chair. Um, I'm back. I just want to make sure that you can hear me. <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Welcome back. Thank you so much, ma'am. <laughs> Is it in order if I continue? Uh, yes, continue like that, yes. Right, right. Thanks very much, ma'am. I'm quickly going to share my screen again. Um, I see the host disabled the participant screen sharing. Is it possible for you to enable my screen sharing again, ma'am? Okay, Alan, would you assist there, please? Are you okay now? You see, I'm still disabled. Well, my screen sharing is still disabled. Okay, they, they, they will try and help you. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh -huh. Alan, are you winning? Yes, he's, he's winning. <laughs> okay, thank you. Great. Right. 
Right. Um, I'm going to start right um, out with my with my comments. Um, the the focus of my comments is section 19 of the bill that deals with the amendment uh, to section 18 of the Competition Act. Um, section 18 of the Competition Act deals with instances where the competition authorities try to review mergers are ousted, in particular by the Minister of Finance where the merger approval is required in terms of the Banks Act or the Financial Markets Act. In all the years, um, I think it, it has happened once that the Minister of Finance actually intervened in a merger before the competition authorities and that they decided to take the merger out of the, well, out of the hands of the Competition Commission for purposes of proceeding with the merger. That was in 2005. Um, in terms of this particular amendment that is foreseen in terms of the bill, uh, not only the Minister of Finance, but also the Reserve Bank Governor will also have that ability to remove the jurisdiction of the Competition Commission um, in instances where merger takes place in terms of Section 166S of the Financial Regulation Act. In other words, where an institution is allowed to enter into a merger where the Reserve Bank determines that it is necessary for an orderly, orderly resolution. Um, my proposal, and I'm going to state this right from the start, be that you um, have an understanding why I'm motivating for this, um, is to provide the competition authorities with the opportunity to review the merger within six months after implementation. So after that section 166 is um, process has started and once that merger has been implemented within six months to provide the regulator with the opportunity to review that merger. In other words, not to remove or to oust the jurisdiction of the competition authority, but to delay it. Uh, so the wording that uh, we proposed in our submission basically um, has the effect of the following within six months after merger has been implemented in accordance with section 166S of the Financial Sector Regulation Act, the Competition Commission shall commence with an investigation into the merger in accordance with section 12A of the Competition Act. And then an important part, um, if any conditions are to be imposed, um, it must be done or it shall be imposed in consultation with the governor of the Reserve Bank. To keep that uh, as a, as a safe uh, landing place to make sure that the systemic aspects uh, of the market is not compromised. So uh, one provides the commission with the ability, but still um, in consultation with the Reserve Bank. Now, um, I proposed uh, six arguments uh, in, uh, well, well I, I argue uh, that the proposal um, is, is important on the basis of six arguments. And they are as follows. The first one is that brand value and the client base may actually remain fairly well intact, even though we are dealing with a merger uh, of this nature. Second point is that much effort uh, is being expended in Africa in relation to financial markets that are quite problematic. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Financial markets are subject to digital disruption which also provides some uh, impetus to make doubly sure um, it is an aspect that could increase concentration quite rapidly. Uh, evidence of banks that have exploited consumer-centric regulation under COVID. So banks may be inclined to use a period of any kind of disruption to uh, uh, make some inroads or to exploit customers. Uh, critical public interest issues that may arise as a result of the merger, which one could imagine, um, and it could be addressed via conditions. Uh, and then it's also in line with current approaches, which is actually quite interesting. So let me quickly um, look at the very first point, and that is the issue regarding brand value. So the first reason why I think that the Commission um, must be allowed to review that merger within a period of six months um, is the fact that brand value and client base may remain fairly well intact, um, especially if this regulatory process is well managed. Um, and ironically, that is actually the purpose of the bill, to make sure that a bank that is 
not only necessarily failing, but they, that is likely to fail, um, or I think the words in the voice is imminent failure, that that process is, is well managed to the effect of making sure that the depositors money are kept safe. So um, the bill may actually work so well, or the act may work so well, that you have a situation where you have two fairly <laughs> well-functioning companies merging, which may have an impact on concentration and the effect of lessening competition um, in that market. Uh, so so uh, that is the first point. Um, the second reason I would like to motivate with reference uh, to, the, to the Africa experience, um, and we are tracking these developments on a daily basis. Um, I think the first important thing that one should remember is that financial markets constitute an important part of Africa's structural transformation. And the reason for that is that financial markets have the responsibility to make sure that the unbanked gets banked. Um, they are the providers of finance, whether it's large businesses or especially small businesses, small and medium sized businesses. So um, although you have a situation where the different economies across Africa differ quite significantly from each other, it's interesting to see that the ways in which these different economies are, are moved and, and um, changed from a structural perspective are remarkably similar. But, but the interesting thing that you also see across Africa is that it is not so easy to deconcentrate financial markets. Um, and in instances where you get a new entrant, it's often an entrant with particular digital capabilities um, that, again, relies on the telecommunications infrastructure, where you have other elements of competition that may be problematic, for example, network effects, and the acquisition of critical mass in a very short period of time. So what ought to contribute to a process of deconcentration may actually, ironically, um, contribute to a new question of concentration. And that is the interesting dilemma that you have with financial markets um, at this moment. So um, I'm quickly going to show you uh, some of the laws in Africa that we are seeing. I'm quickly going to run through them, um, many of them aim to make sure that banks are well behaved in relation to consumers. And that is not necessarily in instances where markets are massively concentrated. That's even in markets that is fairly competitive. And you will also see here and there some um, regulatory attempts to, to be proactive, pretty much in the same way um, that this piece of um, legislation also tried to be proactive, anticipating issues of this nature. But if we look, for example, at Southern Africa, we have seen um, here in, in SA, the introduction of conduct of financial institutions bill, aiming to protect financial customers against financial institutions, because a code of conduct has failed. Um, in Angola, we've seen the competition regulatory, um, our regulatory authority, um, have been making recommendations to government on the regulation and operationalization of the electronic payment system. Um, this is some kind of a, a proactive attempt to make sure that uh, that part or that, that the, the electronic system um, keeps uh, intact with, with, with um, market developments. Um, Zambia, the publication of prohibition against unwarranted charges and fees the publication of regulations of specific charges, also an attempt to make sure that banks are not exploiting consumers. Namibia, publication of three documents, um, bank fees comparisons, uh, regulations relating to unfair terms in transactions or contracts between banking institutions and customers, determination of the disclosure of bank charges. 
Um, the examples that I'm giving here are examples from the past 12 months. So these are quite recent examples that I'm providing here, you with here, um, just to give an indication um, of Africa's struggle in ensuring that financial institutions uh, remain well behaved. Um, East and Central Africa, um, Ethiopia is a very interesting example, and, and the, the change that, we've, that I've mentioned here is very recent. The World Bank um, recently put pressure on Ethiopia to ensure that the two new entrants that will be entering their market, and this is in the telecoms industry, will also have the ability to provide mobile money service. So just to give an indication of the importance of mobile money, and remember, um, as I've mentioned before, mobile money comes with a new challenge of network effects and critical mass. Um, in Rwanda, we've seen financial consumer protection laws coming into effect. Lately, there's been an outcry among users regarding banking costs being considered prohibitive and unjustifiably expensive. In Uganda, there was the publication of banking fees comparisons in an effort to improve transparency. North Africa, in Morocco, there's an investigation into collusion between banks and insurance companies. In Libya, the central bank published a report calling for the development of laws enhancing competition between banks. Egypt, new banking law containing provisions on fair competition has come into effect um, and makes provision for the regulation of latest technological developments in banking. And in Tunisia, quite interesting, and I'll just uh, touch base on that now now again, there's an investigation into collusion, post-exploitation during the pandemic. So I think um, what we have here, uh, sorry, what I think there's still a West African example. Um, in Nigeria, there's also investigations uh, into consumer protection aspects in relation to banks. There's a combined attempt by two sets of regulators in banking and telecoms to open up digital financial services. Waimu, the central bank, prioritized financial inclusion and competition. Senegal, um, government uh, um, was requested by consumer associations very recently to force banks to standardize their price lists. And in Benin, a decree was promulgated, establishing financial services regulator responsible for the regulation of competition in the financial services market and the relationship between financial institutions, consumers, and SMEs. So the reason why I'm providing you with all of these examples, and I'm, I'm mindful not to, not to bore you with these, is just to explain um, how, how difficult it is to deconcentrate these markets and that so many laws are now required to manage or to regulate the conduct. And therefore, it is quite important that if it's at all necessary to preserve the structure of a financial market right up front, that opportunity should be taken. Um, the third argument, why the COMCOM uh, must uh, uh, be allowed to consider a merger um, fairly soon after the implementation um, is something that I've mentioned. Financial markets are subject to digital disruption and in digital, the issue of critical mass is crucial and the issue of first mover advantage may leave others behind. So if you have a situation where some of the two banks are first mover in any of those areas, uh, you could actually have a situation of a runaway uh, institution leaving uh, others uh, behind, making it very difficult for the competition commission to come back at the later stage in terms of other parts of the act, um, which might take years to enforce from in, a, in the context of litigation, just to try to um, uh, normalize that market again. Uh, the fourth reason is evidence of banks having exploited regulations during COVID. And this was an example in, in Tunisia that we found. Um, and that was interesting because even the spirit of those regulations uh, have been quite clear. The regulations basically said that banks must postpone their loan repayments um, in, in relation to customers to mitigate the COVID-19 effects. So what did the banks do in Tunisia? They colluded. On what? Well, they passed the loan repayment costs to the consumer. They charged additional interest. They imposed penalties for those late payments. And they imposed fees for the extended 
maturity of the loans. Um, keep in mind that this is happening during a disruption where consumers are also confused. Um, any instance of disruption open up opportunity for exploitation. The interesting thing is that in um, Tunisia, the banks actually motivated the violation and they said, well, there was an absence of a legal and a regulatory framework governing the operation of a postponement of the loans and governing the repayment of such postponed loans. And they also said um, there's the non-existence of a decision by the Ministry of Finance in relation to that. So <laughs> it is actually quite interesting. Um, they, they, they knew what the spirit of the regulations were, but because the regulations were not complete in their view, they, they took a chance and exploiting that. Um, and I do not want to speak out of turn, um, but in many instances, uh, these large institutions get legal advice uh, in relation to what are the loopholes in relation to this particular uh, law and how can it be exploited. So um, this is just something that I wanted to emphasize that one should be careful that, especially when you deal with some kind of a, a disaster type scenario, uh, to be rather to be as proactive as possible to consider the complete event and the implications of that. Um, and then uh, the fifth uh, argument is that conditions might serve to mitigate public interest effects. Um, and we have moved beyond um, a, a regime where conditions only pertain to the, to the um, merger uh, situation in particular. Um, something that we have seen um, in relation to employment conditions is, for example, re-employment conditions. And that, for example, um, is uh, where the commission requires a merged entity to re-employ workers whenever vacancies arise in future. And that sounds like something that may be quite useful for the competition commission to do in instances like a section 166S situation, because you have a, a failure or an imminent failure, but maybe it can be solved uh, with relatively few casualties. Um, and people have to go in the short term and one can understand that, but um, maybe in a year or two when there are again some vacancies, then it may be actually quite uh, uh, an ideal situation to be in the position to have that institutions calling previously uh, retrenched employees uh, and, and offering them some employment. Uh, it may also, uh, the chance to review a merger may also provide with an opportunity to, to propose other conditions, for example, empowerment conditions, um, or conditions speaking to regulatory safeguarding, depending on what exactly caused the failure or the imminent failure, um, or monitoring conditions regarding performance in particular. None of these things will be possible if the Commission's jurisdiction is ousted completely and permanently. Um, and then uh, the last reason uh, why I think it's important to keep the COMCOM involved in the process just on a delayed basis is that it is in line with current approaches. Um, what I'm suggesting, suggesting is not completely um, <laughs> out of the out of context. Um, the Act currently makes provision for the Commission um, having the ability to require the notification of small mergers for a period of up to six months after a merger has taken place. Small mergers are not typically notifiable, only intermediate and large mergers are. But there's already uh, uh, a provision in the Act making provision for the Commission to call mergers, which are small, to investigate them. Um, also, uh, there's a, a section um, providing for conditions to be imposed in relation to such mergers. So that's also not out of the ordinary. What I would suggest in these instances is to keep the SOAP involved, to make sure that conditions um, do not compromise whatever has been achieved as a result of the process uh, contemplated by the board. So that is probably um, uh, a new, kind of provision um, 
but uh, the act, the Competition Act makes provision for consultation with ministers, um, but that should not be a principal issue. Um, it's also in line with the dual emphasis that we uh, get in the Competition Act on competition and the public interest. And um, this is not something that is foreign to the competition authorities. Um, it's been in the act for the past 20 years, and it's been really <laughs> properly uh, uh, implemented in the last 10 years, at least. And um, the Minister of, of Industry, Trade, Industry and Competition can also become involved on the basis of public interest grounds in any merger, not just large and intermediate, but also small mergers. So there is proper safeguards, um, and the Commission is, is well um, trained in looking at very, very complicated balancing uh, acts. It's also in line with the Commission's policy approach, emphasizing complexity and the willingness to act on the temporal dimension. And we've seen this during COVID, and we've seen how successful that worked. Um, but to retain that responsibility to act where it is urgent and where it is necessary, uh, and that the short term is not prioritized over the long term, um, and that one does that one makes sure that you do not save X amount of rand um, in the short term, but taking that amount and spreading it out over generations in terms of the effect of anti-competitive effects. Um, and very interestingly, and this is something that we pick up in Africa, um, that there's an increased emphasis by competition authorities for rapid market repair. Um, in other words, they come up with ways um, in which they want to prevent litigation um, as, as largely as possible with, um, uh, in, in an effort to make sure that the market retains or goes back to the, to the pre-harm situation as quickly as possible. For example, through um, additional uh, 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 alternative dispute uh, 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 resolution uh, measures. So that in a nutshell um, is basically my, my motivation why I think it's important to retain the Competition Commission in the process so that they have the opportunity to also see, is it necessary for this potential monster, maybe an Epson a Standard Bank that has just merged, um, is, it, is it necessary to conduct, to, to impose some conditions, whether it's behavioral or structural, um, and as I said, um, in consultation with the Reserve Bank. Uh, right, um, if there's any questions, I will gladly take them. Thanks very much, uh, and um, yeah, also for your patience regarding my connectivity issue. Thank you very much, um, Chair Abram. Thank you. Thank you so much, Odi. That was loud and clear. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think you, you had to be kicked out first so that you can come in clearer. Yeah, I think absolutely. it was just a, a divine intervention. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank so you. <laughs> yes. Um, now, honourable members, we are at the item where it says deliberations, and at this point, I will I, I identify hands. Of course, I will be assisted by Teboho and uh, Alan in identifying the hands of uh, members who would like to speak. Um, I think we're not necessarily closing the discussion to only honorable members. Any participant at this stage who would like to raise an issue is welcome to do so, but representing a particular structure. Thank you. Alan, uh, any hands over there?
All right. Okay. In the absence of, of hands or, or questions for clarity, maybe one uh, is correct to say at this point, the presentations have been noted and I think there will be a specific day for the responses from National Treasury and other sectors that are attached to, nat to National Treasury, uh, which are probably uh, relevant to the bill. We will, on that particular day, make sure that the stakeholders that have presented here are invited to come and hear the responses as well as probably make their points even clearer. But at this stage, before we adjourn, if I may, uh, Comrade Matthew, do you have any point of emphasis that, that you would like to bring across at this time? Um, yeah, no, no, thanks very much, uh, Honorable Chairman. I think, well, just the two points that, <clears throat> that we said, um, I mean, I think for us, this is a progressive and a, a welcome bill. Um, I think our experiences in South Africa and across the across the world, um, you know, VBS is just a critical level why we need such a bill. So I don't think anyone can really oppose its interventions or proposals, its common sense. But I think really, Comrade Chair and members and Treasury colleagues, I think our one simple plea is that we need to find wording to insert in the ranking of creditors or when disposing of, of uh, liquidated banks' assets that we prioritize pensioners, workers, the unemployed in that ranking. They shouldn't be somewhere down the queue. They should be the front of the queue, given their limited resources, the lack of other sources of income. So I think that's our, our fundamental emphasis, Comrade Chair. And hopefully, um, between ourselves, honorable members, um, the legal advisors and treasury would be able to find that kind of common understanding. I don't think anybody could be could be opposed to such a progressive uh, call by, by Kosatu. We're hopeful we'll find each other, Comrade Chair, but thank you very much. Thanks to colleagues in Treasury. Okay, thank you so much, Comrade Matthew. Um, Odi, do you want to come in for the last shot? Thank you very much, Chair Abraham. Uh, maybe just the last point I'd like to raise, and that is that um, we are seeing uh, across Africa how the different regulators learn from each other. And that is quite uh, prevalent. Um, and I think that will even get stronger under the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. And in that context, I think it would be great if the South African Reserve Bank um, and this particular bill could set the example uh, of retaining um, as much oversight and retaining that responsibility of ensuring the competitiveness of markets uh, because of the long-term effect that that may have. Um, for example, uh, Mozambique is also in the process of establishing uh, a, a bill uh, like this. Um, and, uh, and the long-term effect of that may be that we lose decades or that we save decades in terms of um, economic growth. Um, one of the challenges that we have with economic um, in, the, in the economic regulatory context with learning by doing is that it often comes at a very great economic cost. Uh, and in order for Africa to move as fast as possible under the Continental Free Trade Agreement, it would be great uh, if we could learn from each other and if South Africa could take the lead in that respect. Thank you very much again. Okay. No, thank you so much, uh, Odi. Thank you, Miss You. Thank you so much for the inputs. Um, we have we have uh, intentionally given you sufficient time so that you can be able to expatiate on your points, so that um, the respondents, if I may. 
uh, also on the platform so that they could also be able to hear exactly what you had to raise. Thank you so much. The fact that you are always uh, prepared to participate in the public hearings uh, really enhances our democracy. And for that, for that, we are really thankful. We are here as a committee so that we not only make laws and perform oversight over departments, but also we are also here to ensure public participation. So thank you so much for making our jobs even more easy. Um, Alan, Debufo, are there any announcements? Uh, it's just that uh, tomorrow morning's meeting, uh, 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock, it's the public hearings on the um, Pension Funds Amendment Bill. Um, I will be sending out the link uh, immediately after this meeting. I've already sent through the submissions and presentations and the agenda. Thank you very much, um, Alan. We have seen the, um, the, the, the presentations. Uh, honorable members, thank you so much for attending this meeting. We thank National Treasury and the various sectors that are attached to National Treasury that we have seen on the platform. We thank uh, parliamentary uh, functionaries as well for the assistance on the program. Thank you so much once again to the stakeholders for making sure that they come and make their views heard in the People's Assembly. Thank you so much for that. Uh, honorable members, everybody, thank you. The meeting stands adjourned. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you.